OK, but I can prepare you to what I'm going to say, because I start with some quotation to justify what I'm going to do. Because, um, so what I will be and how I will be presenting uh, the, the, the things will be not, some may call, it, may, may call it not quite mathematics, because I will be talking mostly of non-mathematics. But then I need authority yeah, who says that exactly what I am doing is mathematics and what you are the guy doing is not. And who is authority? Of course, yeah. And uh, as usual, if you quote somebody like Poincaré, right? and what Poincaré said about mathematics. So what is mathematics according to Poincaré? Right? When he was asked, and he says about the set in English, that he said mathematics is the art to give the same name to different things. Okay? And therefore, it's not playing with these names, what mathematicians do, but giving these names. And to give this name, you know the things to which they apply. And actually, another person whom he really respect was Grothendieck, and he also was master of that. He was giving names to things, identifying, he mostly was looking objects or things, call them, inside of math and giving them right names. And the same, so, and Poincaré had in mind mostly physical things, but if we have time, I mentioned he was also identifying some interesting structures, in, say, in psychology, which was this particular mathematical structure, he didn't give a name to it, but he identified it and it still has not been absorbed by mathematicians though it has been he done it about uh, more than 100 years ago. Though this idea was, of course, independently used by, by genetists, how they can reconstruct uh, old classical genetics, how they reconstruct the shape of, of chromosomes by, by observable data, which they never, not microscopic ones, but looking in the colors of the eyes of the flies, drosophila, looking how this color change, they could say that your genes are on the string and how they position there. Yeah? And this is a mathematical problem they solved for this particular case. But certainly formalism general theory has not been developed and because mathematicians are certainly not aware of that, about this thing which is, I think, is one of the remarkable, real kind of remarkable pattern of logical structure immersed into biology has not, or, or in psychology, has not been instructed. The same vision work more or less by the same principle. So, but, ah, ah it's already there, ah, good. I didn't realize it works so nicely. And so, do you, can you see it, yeah? It's big enough, so this Poincaré. And specifically, I will be speaking about probability. Recording in progress. Yeah. And so I will be speaking mostly about, so I still, so, I say so, 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 so. Uh, about probability, and then I quote another not so famous person among mathematicians who was an evolutionary biologist and, and done quite. And uh, so, if you, if you want to understand probability, you have to understand something. So, what he was saying, he was saying that you cannot understand biology, nothing makes sense in biology except if you look for evolution. So what's the point from a mathematical perspective? So why evolution gives unity of biology? Mathematically, why? What are the key words? Because it makes it connected, right? Organisms are disconnected. If you take evolution tree, they become connected via this tree. Actually, structure is, more, as we know, more interesting than a tree. There's a graph, and there are kind of crossings. It's a remarkably interesting graph involving evolution, and then it is have this unique picture. And indeed, the way we think about life is like that. And that's the point, it's a mathematical point. But the way very much ideas, both in physics and in biology, are mathematical, albeit they are not formulated this way. But this is mathematics and is, for, 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 but somehow we mathematicians are unaware of that. Yeah? You know, that most of mathematics is done by non by mathematicians, one which I kind of recently, well, recently, in my, in, in my terms, 20 years ago, recently, I learned that 90% of work on partial differential, on, on ordinary differential equation is done by whom? In which journals? Who do, who do it? Chemists. 
is dynamical chemical reaction. And they have very developed theory of stability that are very different from what mathematicians do. And it's much, in my view, have much more ideas and much more substance. And I explain, by the way, why. But this is not the, the, what I'm talking now. So I will say, say a little bit about that. So let's proceed, yeah? So we speak about probability theory. Ah. So here is the point that probability came from modeling real life phenomena. The first phenomena was, you know, game was, you know, this game like like throwing the dice, yeah. And uh, gambling. And uh, it was historically so, and the first person who made mathematical theory of that was Galileo, who never wrote it. Then it was Cardano, whose published was later, and then I think the first publication was by Pascal, and it was, it was co corresponded between Pascal and Fermat. Well, Galileo had done it about 70 years earlier, everything he understood, of course, and just any kind of person of his level of intelligence would understand how dice goes and this and this and that way. And so, but this is not, it is prehistory. And then, but another parameter, so there are the shoes, yeah, to which mathematics applied, but then there is who does it, and there is the ecology. And here is a kind of point, which again, questionable and very much debatable, so what I'm going to say. But for all you know, it's like that. Why we have to, from, to do mathematics, we have to go outside of mathematics. And do we have any limitation? Ourself imagine something. And, and so what I be, think is true, and which can be justified, uh, indirectly of course, that we all, first we know that we all people are genetically very, very much the same. Variation between, you know, people much smaller than between, say, chimpanzee in Africa. Yeah? They, in this, chimpanzee have more variety than we do, because all humanity went through s s several bottlenecks. Right, and this must be understood. Yeah. But there are many, many things about ourselves, by the way. You cannot explain things rationally about human behavior, politics, whatever, unless you have background to which compare with. And this comparing is, of course, the biology of most of our predecessors of primates. And therefore, there is all reason to believe our brains, all our brains work more or less the same. And they were programmed, in fact, much earlier, before we became primates. So there are basic programs running them, and they're all the same. So ta, 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 and that's it. So we cannot do something beyond them. When we say P and P problem, quite possible, there is a very simple solution of either of them. But inside of our brain, there is no way to find this. Right? Because, and of course, using computers or whatever doesn't help. Yeah. Yes, there is fundamental limitation. Of course, power of computation allows partly overcome it, but if because you play again exponential, no computer will help you. Maybe quantum computers may change this, maybe not, but therefore, we are fundamentally limited in what we can imagine. And this, of course, major bottleneck for our activity in mathematics. We have not enough imagination, we just... And so when you look at the real things, we learn something, not because nature is smart, but because we are stupid. This is the whole pr principle should be understood. Some people say, well, evolution is smarter than you are. No, it's dumb, stupid, fantastically stupid. Nothing is more stupid than evolution, except for humans or animals. Uh, we, are, we are stupid because we are a little part of this evolution. If you look how evolution works, it's the most primitive you know, algorithm you can imagine. Live or die, doesn't work, throw away. Take on run, work, does throw away. And this is how we are made. So we are made by the most stupid process of our brains, the most primitive machine you can imagine. However it works, for some reason we don't understand, and this is a mathematical problem. Why the hell still our brain works, despite all this built in stupidity? So, but theism, given two justifications. First, great authority of Poincaré, and then kind of this kind of negation of any authority. Now we go to the subject matter of this, and now we look at things. Uh, so look at things, yeah. Let's look at this picture, we return to them. The first picture will be the last that we'll be discussing. And this will be about homology. 
and homological probability. This is a crystal, and this is a kind of, a, I imagine, kind of organic crystal, where ingredients are highly non-symmetric, and still it displays symmetry, and it's quite a remarkable thing how the hell happens. And uh, the problem, of course, when you look at the kind of mathematics, even applied mathematics, is you already have somebody made models for that, and you work with these models. So you don't work with real things. You work with models done by somebody. And this somebody may be great scientist or maybe secondary scientist. And we mathematicians just take it for granted. So we don't know what is the right model for crystal. We don't know this, these are cells, cellular structures. It's just how membranes are formed, very, very similar to, to soap films. For example, there are soap films. It's a remarkable structure, you know, it's soap films. And then there is mathematical theory of geometric measure theory. You know, measure theory, ta -ta -ta. who said it? that this is the model. So I don't know who said it. But it's not the adequate model, right? There are much more structure there, and possibly, mathematically, it would be much more advantageous to, to look at the things as it is and use all resources su suggested by this structure. This is what I want to, want to do. But on the other hand, as we continue that with these pictures, for example, ah. This is about to be slightly mystifying on purpose. So this is a picture of Morse function, but I think about this protein folding by percolation. So, so again, if you look at protein folding, you think about percolation, Morse function, you can make this picture, then you have to, again, because we give the same name to different things, so, and I will see that, I will show you at some moment how it works. Then the spectrum, also part of this picture, and the last one, uh, among them, self-avoiding Renvok. So, the, the uh, probability theory, just the, the, the part I was mostly talking here, was came back to Flory, who was a chemist and who done much, lots of practical things, and he invented two mathematical theory. One of them was percolation theory, which at his time was called, and he was used as gelation theory and also the self-avoiding random walk. And, uh, and, and he just not invented them like that, in particular the self-avoiding random walk. He understood this, how these molecules behave, and he made computation and make predictions, and the prediction we confirmed by experiment. So it is a by order high level of kind of achievement of any mathematical theorem. And uh, in percolation now, and he also, the, along this line, he made percolation theory, and also it was experimentally verified, and it's called gelation. For example, you know that if you boil, boil an egg, and this liquid stuff become a rigid at some moment. So what happens, yeah? And there is kind of flurry theory, and says under what condition this phase transition from this movable stuff to the rigid one. And he made specific computation, of course, like any scientist, it's just not theory, but computation and verification. And computation is a tough stuff. You know, when Hilbert wrote his equation, Einstein equation, derived by variational principle, which actually uh, only him and Einstein knew about the time it was kind of hidden for many years by Herman Weyl for some reason. And, um, and Hilbert was kind of lamenting that Einstein was so good with computation, he could pre predict this, uh, this variation, you know, this error made by Merc Mercury. And, uh, and Einstein told me this, yeah, I'm not I was working two, 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 two and a half years, in a half a life after that, and I invited so many people who helped me with computation. This was the hardest part of making this relativity theory. He said all the equations was more or less obvious to me, but to make computation was the real work, and, to, and then it happened to be right. Right? In mathematics, we don't have this problem, right? So I just want to say that it was not just writing equation, right? which again, for this, because these guys who are involved in the nature, they have kind of intuition, and somebody right, and then they go to computation. They don't care with rigor, what we call rigor. Because I, I return to that in a moment. But why it is, by the way, it's self-avoiding random work? What has to do with this picture? Yeah. And again, I want to explain this mathematical perspective. And so I'm not... I'll be talking about lots of subjects which I really know almost nothing about, right? Like random walk, percolation, proteins, whatever. And uh, except for the very end, 
and they know a little bit. And so, and, and my attitude towards all these objects, or the, the things, is not really understand them as scientists would understand, but just as a source of inspiration and make some mathematical fantasies of them. And this, of course, I feel a little bit bad any time I give this kind of lecture. And uh, actually, I just, I just quote a friend of mine, because I, I'm not certain he won't be mentioned, but, so I don't say who. And he said that there are, he was actually a physicist, yeah, great problem like him was mentioned quantum gravity. It would be nice and it cannot be solved within, say, 10, 20, 20 years. But he said it will never be solved unless some other problem is solved. Well, this is another problem, without which quantum gravity cannot be solved. It's the problem of soil depletion. In 20 years, the world will be starved because soil will disappear. And the major problem, he claims, is soil science, to understand how to save soil on Earth. It is the most depleted resource we have. It's not water, it's not air, it's not temperature, it's soil. And it's extremely complicated, mathematically, incredibly complicated structure. And what's the problem with that? So you need people mathematically minded to do that. But to do that, you have to spend five or six years learning soil. And there is no structure. If you have a young, young man comes and five years learn mathematician, learn for soil, he, he is nowhere, he has no position, he has no, no money, he will disappear. There is no structure to do that. It cannot, do by, it cannot be done by a man. It must be a community. Mathematicians, biologists, physicists, chemists working on that. It is a however, so how we still solve the problem? How we go around it? It is a horrible problem. And then we say, huh, there are smaller creatures which much smaller heads than ourselves and they solve this problem. And you know who they are? Our big head is no problem. They're called ostriches. You fire, you, you put your head into the sand. Everything is fine. And now we do our mathematics. And so what we do. Okay, <laughs> that's sad, sad truth, but this it is, and still we enjoy our life, you know, unless we can. So, I'll go to the next. So, what, uh, so what is the role of mathematics? Again, maybe just I want to make some remark. Uh, that Mathematics is when we speak about different things in life and how they were treated by scientists, we speak about the rigor and say something rigorous, something unrigorous. And this for me, because there are this dangerous errors which can crop in. And so mathematics in this, from, uh, at, at this point uh, plays the role of the immune system. When there are errors, bacteria or some, some distortion going into your body, it kills them and just pre create pure environment. In particular, one of the job of immune system, at least part of this so-called complementary system, is a particular collection of proteins. Again, I'm saying that I know very little about that yet, but yes, the research, I think, don't think I am an expert on that, but the research you think, which is called synaptic pruning. So when you develop, you know, this connection in your brain, and this connection determines your function of your brain, and it's evolved with your age, and there is synaptic pruning just destroying unneeded synapses. You know, most of the development of the brain consists of breaking something in, not building in, but breaking in. Actually, it's also in very interesting evolutionary. If you look, evolution of uh, organization of the so motor system of the brain, and you see my synapses, say, will go from frogs to, to, <coughs> to lizard, much of the synapses disappear, become more organized and fewer synapses. Uh, those chaotic organization synapses become more structural, hierarchically organized, and there are much smaller of them. And this synaptic pruning, absolutely necessary, we would develop without that, but sometimes the immune system overdone that. And this is what happened then, and then it becomes as schizophrenia develops. And so, by the way, there is some similarities, again, for the friend of my saying, but what is common between mathematicians and psychophrenics? Only these two people may trust a chain of ten consecutive, consecutive arguments. Right? In life, one or two is enough, you know, chain breaks down. But in mathematics, ten still be there, which is, of course, miraculous why it works, which we certainly don't understand. Now, coming back to probability. And so we know about this 
historically. So this probability as a way, as I said, you need for biology to be understood, have a connected unity by evolution. The same I want to say about probability, to understand probability, because probability is, the way I see, it's not one domain. There are many domains and they almost don't talk to each other, but they have some common sources. And then we can understand them looking at the source, look at the history. And the first there was the prehistory, of course, there was very old the time, I don't speak about that. But we're starting with law of large numbers, and this is a kind of phenomena in probability. It's a thing, it's a remarkable, simple theorem, and uh, which underlies physical thinking about that. And it was in the modern time, there were two people who contributed, who used it to make kind of fundamental contribution. Uh, it was three, maybe, yeah, it was Maxwell and Mendel, more or less uh, contemporary in 19, uh, 1860. Uh, I think the Maxwell paper was about 60 and Mendel 63, and then it was Boltzmann who developed it uh, further, and then, yeah, I'll say in a couple of words what, what each of them done, and then, so, so what Mendel, uh, the, the point of Mendel is, but looking at statistics, he was not looking in the flies, but looking in the beans, looking at how they develop, you could say that inheritance was discrete. And moreover, it consists of two parts, at least for with particular being and also for human, right? And this tremendous kind of, a, you can imagine what would happen if Boltzmann knew of Mendel, because Boltzmann was obsessed with the idea that the world is discrete, there is atomic. And then this discre discreteness was discovered earlier by Mendel in biology. And uh, Boltzmann was very much kind of excited by by logic of Darwin, history, and was kind of this formalization, mathematization of, of, of biology. And if he knew about Mendel, he would really jump over the, over the roof. Uh, but biologists who had contemporary look at Mendel thought, oh, well, it's not interesting, it's mathematics. And, um, and then, so this, the, work of, the work of Boltzmann was kind of culminated by, the, by, by the Einstein Smolkowski, who Analyzing, uh, analyzing um, experiment by by Ingelhaus. Is his name Ingelhaus? Do you know who he is and why it's such a? I don't know if he looks brown here. You know, it's a fantastic story about Ingelhaus. He discovered the following thing. He studied this and wrote the papers and gave a pretty good model idea that a tiny little particle of dust. Move, uh, look in the water, look in the microscope, they make this kind of crazy movement, you know this, yeah? Do you have a chalk? Oh, thank you, thank you very much. You know, there is this kind of little particle, and it l looks like that. Yeah, yeah. And how it could, could be. And then Einstein and Smolkowski figure it out, and, and it, it can be said, and uh, so what is this the, the small comp 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 little particle set in perpetual motion by the impact of invisible blows and the movement mounts up, etc. Who said that? Yeah, this was actually understood. It was discovered by Inkelhaus in this in the brown colors in white brown because brown in motion. Because Brown, apparently in the house, was carrying Brown something because it's called Brownian motion. I don't know. I know that another explanation, yeah. Physicists make conjecture with somebody Brown who invented that. Physicists are very kind of physically oriented. We see Brown color, okay, it was Brown, I thought a person called Brown. Actually, it was a person called Brown. And actually, he studied Brownian motion, but he certainly understood much less of this than English House. Yeah. Bra Bra English House is a great scientist, by the way. And we, of course, he never heard of that. But he discovered something which, uh, if it were not there, this object, you would, wouldn't be that Phot photosynthesis, right? Not, not, not a joke, yeah, it was really one of the greatest discoveries of, 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 of the time. And you nobody know, knows about him and know about Brown, because Brown is a simple word, of course, yeah. In Gilhaus, who can remember such a word, such a name? But he, and, uh, but there is something constructive, however, about that which I, to which I come, come back. And, uh, and then, but who said that? The movement mounts up. Was it Einstein, Smolkowski, or somebody else? No? 
Of course, the translation. And translation from what language? Huh? From the Greek? From Latin, I guess. It was Titul Kretzos. And it was said about 2,000 years ago. And so this mathematical idea had to wait for, for 2,000 years. And there was this Einstein work and Smolkowski who described it, and that there was Wiener integral. And so interestingly now, by the way, that I, I don't know about Smolkowski, but I, I read about, I haven't read Einstein paper. Einstein modeled this by Brownian motion. Yeah, it is, it is a particle, and it is hit by molecules. And then it's what you see, because when they accumulate just enough, you have Brownian motion. And but more subtle experiment, I believe I read, but I haven't looked carefully, is not Brownian motion. So Einstein was wrong. It was not Brownian motion, but the outcome of the formula was right. And it was enough, good enough to measure the size of atoms, to measure Avogadro number, which was done by Perrin here about uh, 10 years after the work in the 20s, who was a great physicist, one of the great French physicists uh, of last century. So this is a, about history. Now about Mendel, let me say something about Mendel, uh, because uh, you, as mathematicians, you've probably heard of Boltzmann theory of gases and the statistical mechanics and, and, and uh, what Maxwell done. S and, um, but one from a mathemat from mathematical point of view is that starting essentially from the law of large numbers, if from nothing, you, you arrive at the symmetry it can become related to the symmetry of the world. And this will come to this again, yeah. It's rather amazing thing inside of logical probability that there is nothing in the probability which tells you a priori it has this orthogonal or unitary symmetry, but it does. You know, sometimes there is a definition. The probability of the measure and determinants, whatever, this kind of a nonsense, which is most annoying, but you mathematicians, however, often do the same, yeah. We laugh at the nonsense done by non-mathematicians, but inside of mathematics, we, we do the same. Because we laugh, people love to give definition. And it's 99%, it's many, many nines after that, it's non nonsensical, this definition. There are great definitions, like you know, Grothendieck was the guy who was giving great definitions. Almost everybody else was, almost everybody else was, I don't know who else was able to do that. Before, after him, yeah, he was a really genius of, of giving the right names or definition of things. And, um, and so, now, and so what about Mendel? So, so let me so say a little story, and just, just to, 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 how, how simple and remarkable is this? Yes, is that? That is imagine, imaginable experiment, which after Mendel, when it was already discovered 30 years or 40 years later, and actually, it was rediscovered, you know, what made Mendel came up. Uh, he was kind of, paper was essentially published, but forgotten. And then it's come how it was rediscovered. So what was the reason for that? Huh? Was it good or bad or what? It was bad. It was jealousy of scientists. So, so two or three group of scientists simultaneously rediscovered Mendel. And so they, f and when they very fa felt very bad, somebody else done it. And some of them look in the literature to just to make some guys bad, look bad and found Mendel paper, which everything was already done. So I, I, don't, well, I don't remember uh, these names. Yeah, they're famous names, they're kind of great scientists also. But this was how it was dis uh, dis uh, discovered. A actually, in mathematics, I think it happens also, right? When you see somebody does it and you do, oh, maybe somebody else already have done that. And how you give names, yeah? And there are many kind of terminology very much reflect that whom you refer to, right? If you discover something and already X was already done it, you say, call X Poincare something. And then you feel better, yeah? That's not the guy who discovered it. This is, there are like Poincare complexes are exactly of this nature. <laughs> Why they call Poincare complexes. And, and so, and so again, well, this is quite a remarkable thing and just it has a, a story. And uh, because little, little mathematics, but immediately kind of uh, give, give a flow of other things, yeah. And the phenomenon is following. So you have a mountain range and you have flowers of two kinds, A and B, say blue and red. 
Actually, it must be blue and white for some reason, which corresponds to for some reason should be better white. White meaning nothing, blue meaning something. And they flourish and everything right, and they don't direct, but they're the same kind of flowers, and then there is some little event, and then this thing disappears for some, this reason or another, whatever it means. And then they become mixed up. And then uh, they inter there is intercrossing, and then they become mixed, and then you see that after the first intercrossing, look at the population, and you hear 10% is blue and the rest is white. What happens on the next round of that? So you lost 90%, 10%. So what will be second intercrossing? What will be proportion? And the Armenian point of view says uh, the strongest survive, then it will be 1%. Right? But Mendel, if you look at computation, says no, nothing happens. It remains 10%. It stabilized on the first step. And this number of two, I'm not cheating, because we have two kind of, two sets of chromosome, and this flower have two sets of chromosome, and this is two, y is, it is x squared, x will x, and this is this two, almost true. Yeah. And this, and well, always especially kind of, and Darwinian biologists were really very annoyed with that and just didn't quite understand it. And then there is a story by Hardy who, who uh, spoke to some biologists and just explained this around some A plus B equals C, wrote an article, half a page in Nature, and exp making excuses he used this multiplication kind of mathematics to explain that. And there was somebody else. Weinberg was a actually medical doctor who wrote 60 pages, also explained it. And this is called Hardy Weinberg Principle, and it's 10 times more referred in science than any paper of Hardy with Littlewood, whatever. It's the most famous paper by Hardy. Hardy would be he crazy, negative, absolutely mad about that because he hated any kind of application. He wanted to be a pure mathematician in this little applied thing. And, but what's funny, Hardy, I think, didn't understand actually mathematics behind it. And, I, and he didn't formulate correctly. And what is mathematical theorem? You know, what I said, what's mathematical theorem? He wrote some formula, I plus B equals C or something, right? Of course, you make computation, it becomes some kind of formula. It's kind of one line computation. But what is mathematical statement behind it? And mathematical statement is very simple, but still it's a mathematical statement. And it's not totally obvious. And it really made it, so the fact that it happens is really rather Amazing. And mathematical statement also, how a simple is counterintuitive. It says you have a matrix. By the way, I don't know what ma I say the word matrix. I don't know what matrix is. This is not such mathematical object as matrix. You can't mathematically define matrix, yeah? Because matrix, some table, a table on the blackboard, that are tight, not mathematics, yeah? But this is okay. Most of mathematics is not mathematical, yeah? Not explainable by mathematics. And so we have this AIG. And what you do, you take sum. AIG by I and multiply by sum AIG by J and to normalize, for example, to say sum equals one, right? So you take, you summate here, summate there and multiply and you, you make the sum of, we have new matrix and you multiply by scale to have some one. With zero you cannot do it, so it's projective. And then it says this transformation, square of this is, it's an important. Square of this equal to, 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 to itself. So it's kind of, kind of elementary, but it's still a mathematical statement. If you go to high and goes go, and there is the whole theory of called the Jordan algebras, which is kind of a, a generalized phenomenon, and then there is a uh, called, called Bernstein algebras and the whole mathematics and just around that. Yeah. But, but Hardy just wrote a formula for some special case because he had two by two matrix which was symmetric, so it was A, B, C, D, and he wrote this in terms of the A, B, C, D, you just saw so what, of course. And, it was, uh, and uh, it's, it's rather amazing. You see, you have to, it's only possible because you normalize. Otherwise, it would be impossible. You, have, you cannot have polynomial squared and repeat polynomial degree growth. But this rational map is not polynomial. And rational map may have property that square of rational map equal to itself. And this is a quite an interesting phenomenon. And so this is. What kind of interesting rational map? And there is theory of rational maps. So that from that, then we can develop huge field, yeah, thinking in this sense. But Hardy missed it. Because he was, of course, I don't want to be impolite, he was really 
kind of master of multiplication table mathematics. He was not a mathematician in modern times. In modern times, it's kind of, certainly I use modern perspective to, to say in these terms. And it was not, not in the time of Hardy. And, OK, so this about, but now about Boltzmann. So we come next. And, and this I just want to, no, I'm afraid I don't. So how, how much we I want to know what happens with time. And because they say he was, he was doing not an, an, an rigorous, in particular with Cermela, and you know, because he was appealing to Poincare current theorem about ergodicity and whatever. And then mathematicians extracted from their concept of ergodicity and, uh, and just yes, and sp and speak about ergodicity, which saying in a kind of more physical term that a time average equals to the space average. And so what Boltzmann didn't know, ergodic theorem, ergodic theorem was proven by von, von, von Neumann and then by Birgov. Of course, from a physicist's point of view, it's not a theorem. It's obvious once being said, of course. You, in the first von Neumann proof, you have a unitary transformation, right? And you start averaging because convexity, of course, converges. And if you take any LP, it converges. And L affinity, it converges. And then you have to look more cl closely. Uh -huh, almost everywhere it also converges. It's exercise for the, for the student. It's not, it's amazingly enough, it's useful for, for certain, it may be useful for certain mathematical purposes, but it's kind of, for me, it's quasi theorem. It has a really no, no substance, it's just epsilon delta exercise. It's kind of exactly this multiplication table kind of mathematics. And what has to do with, 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 with the system of these particles? Absolutely, the big mystery. Nobody ever, people say, mathematicians, oh, ergodic theorem for balls, for billiard, which, by the way, people who claim to prove it never proved it. But what has to do with, with the behavior? You look at this space, and as Boltzmann said, absolutely right, that we have, we have to wait more than the time the proton would decay unless this theorem can be apl applied. Yeah. Amazingly enough, the proof of that is usually informative, but the theorem itself completely useless. And, and so what Boltzmann was saying, so the Gordic theorem doesn't help. But what was happening, in my view, that people we are trying to understand Boltzmann from point of view of set theory. And corresponding probability theory, set theory probability theory was axiomatized by Kolmogorov. So what Kolmogorov done, he just translated what Buffon done. And what Buffon done, he, and he, I think he was the first, maybe it was done before him. But for all, at least he was one of the people who realized that probability has continuous counterpart. And that, in particular, you can speak about probability of point on the circle. And he was doing experiments, actually. Yeah, he was throwing baguette of a squared kind of parquet and see how it crosses the lines. And so, not that this mathematics has anything to do with, with bakery, but it was c coming from real life. And if you just formalize mathematically, you have this Kolmogorov theory. And this is just an exercise in set theory. I don't never understood what the point. There was a lecture, actually, but it was not online about history of this, of this work by, by Kolmogorov because it was formulated by Hilbert, how to axiomatize probability. And it was really kind of people tried and didn't quite work. This is a mystery for me. Yeah? And for me, it's all not adequate for most purposes. Right? It's, it's very kind of, moreover, it never rigorously was made. It must be understood because it depends on Cermelo-Frankel theory. Cermelo-Frankel theory never was exposed 100%, I guess because you use set, sets of measures zero, and the set of them is a modern continuum, and how you can work with this. Well, for me, it's a big mystery. I mean, it's, it's not nonsensical theory, but it's certainly very strange, strange very strange uh, stuff. Yeah. Probability is not about that. Probability about numbers, more combinatorial, and not about that. But so what, 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 but how Boltzmann was going around that? But Boltzmann was going next step in mathematics, actually two steps. He was, wasn't here. He has intuition. And if you translate it to the modern language, uh, he was introduced two ideas. Was one functoriality of certain operation, and secondly, use on infinitesimals. Of course, infinitesimals were suggested by, by Leibniz, and then kind of not not kind of used and not considered seriously for a while. But this exactly what was happening with, with Boltzmann, and and if you 
just reinterpret Boltzmann in these terms, you have completely different setting for probability theory. And so what he was saying, there are systems, and systems are not sets, but something, system object, and you can interact with them. And you have kind of morphism, and they certain functoriality, and something happening, and in particular, there is a particular function from the category of, of his objects, which are not dynamical system, but kind of object imitating dynamical system ensembles of particles. And this is the language, by the way, used of the dynamical system and ensembles. They were not sets, and they are not set, the object of categories. And you arrive at Boltzmann equation. And then from Boltzmann equation, there was next step to, uh, to the hydrodynamic equations, it's S and Scott Chapman hierarchy. And then there was the next step was B, B, G, K, Y hierarchy. And P physicists were writing that using their physical intuition, but from a mathematical point of view, they were kind of natural functions in certain category, and this category was introduced by Boltzmann. So this is my understanding. It was never formalized what they're saying, but I'm pretty certain the, the, the way things are. Now, let me say a few words. What is Boltzmann equation? And if you look at the book, there's some formulas, integral, ta 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 But if you think about it in functorial terms, what means functorial terms? It means you speak in common language. Our common language is how, how we do that. By the way, this is, I, I picked up from Gerfan. He hated when somebody was writing formulas or making pictures. Everything must be described in words. But mathematics is kind of about words, and you have to say it correctly. If you have correct definition, correct words, you don't need computation. Maybe at the very end, you have to make computation with the formula, but that is secondary. And certainly, pictures are also not allowed. So what is, what is this? So in common words, very simple that you have this particle moving on random, and then they come collide when they move in this direction, and then there is a rule how they go out. And so the Boltzmann equation desc describes probability of the flow of particle in a particular point, particular direction. And this is how I describe it. And there may be different rules how they interact and they have different equations. And the sim simplest, of course, they just whoop, boom, you have this, uh, this re reflection, or they may have some shape, or they may rotate, it, it, it may be different. And at, at, at some time, it was, I was looking at that, it was a long time ago, mm, how much, almost 50 years ago, I guess, yeah? <laughs> it's right, more, more not, maybe 45 years ago, and people who are doing that, there are many, many articles just doing this function, uh, writing equation, this condition, this condition, this condition, this condition, just using the same kind of operation what I described. Now, as a mathematician, you know how, now it's trivial. Given this thing, you can describe it, it's functorial. And, but what Hilbert was unhappy, and he was also unhappy about this sec second step, that it was not rigorous. You write a function in heaven, but it's not, not rigorous in the sense that so Boltzmann's operation, thinking about this, is infinitesimal. Things move in this infinitesimal moment when they collide. But the real thing, and we want to go to the limit and say this something happened in the limit. It's still unknown. There is a theorem by Lanford, but it concerns the scale of time, which is un unphysical. And from physics' point of view, well, the first model was just a model. And there's the second model. You derive one from another. You have to check if it's correct or not. But this is still very complicated to verify, a question very hard to solve. Unless it's very, very rarefied gas, and then it's reasonably well survived. And then there is the next step, and this is Anscock Chapman hierarchy. So from this equation, so I give you, so what is the problem here? Because if they were independent, you don't know if there is no correlation after collision. And you assume there is no correlation, but the simplest assumption, nothing happens except this. So there is no correlation, right? And again, this is a, again, an interesting point that all many physical uses of probability made on the fact, on the assumption that there is no correlation. These things are independent. And no correlation after the shock? After the shock. There is no, there creates no correlation. So they were the same level of randomness before and after. And a priori it's not so. You have to prove it under, under certain conditions they is by Lansford saying, but this is related to the time scale when, you know, half of the free mo motion before collision is tiny, it's not really, kind of, not really sick. But again, physicists uh, look at this differently, and they derive first the equation which is verifiable, and they had dynamic equations. And like early equation, Navier-Stokes equation, then Grad equations. And there was a scheme of that suggested by Anscog and Chapman, and this by the Anscog, the 
sad story. I look at the internet about him. He was a school teacher. He couldn't get position in, in academia. And he done his fundamental work. And Chapman, who was well established, he realized it and trying to. He was in Sweden, yeah. And Chapman was an Englishman who done other work on different things, and he was quite well established. And it took a long time before Ensk could come to academy. And kind of it's happened you know, also in mathematics. I don't know exactly what was the problem. But, uh, and so, and then Hilbert was involved in that, and Hilbert was unhappy that this only works if you assume smoothness of solution. So, this equation in the space of momenta, and this equation in the spatial space, like liquids, so you, you reduce dimension, but you have more and more complicated equations. And this reduction works only if you assume smoothness. But again, from a certain point of view, it's a material because it's a function from one class of equation to another class of equation. It's really natural, and, and physics is doing it by their intuition. And what is instructive, Hilbert himself wrote alternative hierarchy using his mathemat mathematical for formalism. It was complete nonsense. Because it was physically wrong, it was given. Uh, I was, you see, now I'm saying from somebody explained to me who knows that. Myself, I never looked at this paper. Okay, so this, uh, if you ask me why so, I cannot answer it. But maybe I can give you a reference. I, I, I mentioned some kind of. I, I mentioned something uh, re references here. And the point is that it's, it's, it's what thing happens of infinite dimensional Riemannian manifold, and you just expand something. At, at one point, like exponential map at one point. And Hilbert kind of was forgetting curvature term right, of this manifold, this curved manifold. And this Ensk in Chapman had his Ensk had physical intuition. And they were governed by the pr principle that entropy must grow. But uh, and if you write Hilbert equation, entropy may go in the wrong direction. And so, so, so the, um, again, here this, when you know, what happens in physics is extremely helpful. It is functorial. Nature is functorial. It's not smart, but because B, not being functorial is just stupid. A implies B, B implies C. That's it. You know, this step and this step. And this kind of this very primitive logic. Everything else comes along. Okay, so, and um, so this let me make interruption. I mean, it's, it's a moment. I can give 10 minutes break. So, so we can run away if you kind of want to. <laughs> You may ask questions, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, why do you mean by what do you mean by functionality? So you have a functionality between the set of equations describing the local interaction. Yeah. If you, if you look, you, 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 you can say it in, in the term of the dynamical system, which I think is wrong. If you have one dynamical system. This Liouville equation describes particle moving. And here is another dynamical system, a, a differential equation, is no, no, time is continuous, in the space of density momenta. And there is a functor from one to another. So you modify condition of your system, and you accordingly modify there. So you modify, it's, it's, it's part not to individual system, to the whole class of Liouville system. And, and, and this class is functorial. I never thought exactly what the class is and what is the right thing, but, the, but obviously how to do it. Yeah, you do it by naturality. You don't care about convergence, yeah, right? And this means it's punctorial, however, describing this category or something like categories, maybe slightly more, it'll be different because there is numbers involved. It is uh, functorial. But if you think a little bit about it, you know how to do that because you, you follow the general logic of something in this functoriality, of course. Right? You modify condition, accordingly modify outcome. This is functoriality. And uh, how, no matter how you call it. But again, it was never formalized. Yeah, yes, it's unclear from thesis that don't give, don't, don't care about that. Mathematicians, it may be interesting if you do that. I think if you go there, you can discover a new world, or maybe you discover nothing. Of course, I don't know. But this exactly, but applies to all of those. Yeah? For example, these people who look at this, whom I know, who explained me about X Cox Shackman hierarchy, discovered the whole world when they look at the meaning of what they are doing. From, from geometrically, it was just. Some infinite dimensional manifold, it's Riemannian geometry of infinite dimensional manifold. And they looking at that, expanding, you know, exponential map of this infinite dimensional manifold, they wrote, found new equations, and they were applied and they apparently confirm what happens in, in some chemical reaction. Right. 
So they claim, but you never know. I wouldn't, these people who done it claim that, but I haven't checked it myself. I gave some reference to their, to their work at some point. Uh, I saw you their work, yeah. So, and, uh, and so this is, uh, this is about, uh, but about Boisman, nobody, I think, has, has, has followed that, yeah. It's kind of, kind of obvious thing to do, but you have to do it. I mean, you have to go through all that to define correct category, and it's very difficult to find correct. You can easily make the wrong category. I mean, just, it's not, it's not obvious. It's an art, yeah. At this moment, mathematics is an art, right? You have, after that, it becomes kind of science, so to speak. But to make the first step, you have to use your intuition. Now, functoriality helps you. It tells you what you look for. It's certainly half science. Yeah, Grothendieck tells you it must be not natural in philosophical sense. It must be natural in mathematical sense. And you kind of, and so, and some categories kind of apparent here and some are not so, and it may be not exactly categories. Yeah. It may be most interesting if there are other naturality which is not covered by functoriality. It would be certainly most amazing if you discovered here, and it's it not, there is a possibility of that. Okay, but now still, let's walk for five minutes. So I just say uh, one word. So I mentioned Bonsk's Bo equation in uh, Ensk Chapman. You know a little bit, you know, had the dynamic equations. And then there's B, B, G, K, Y, it's five people who discovered this independently, which is rather, rather trivial stuff in my view. That now you have many uh, Boltzmann about two particles. Now look at the description with K particle. You know, a distribution of moving K particles and see how it develops when you write equation. However, it involves bigger number of particles, so you have infinite chains of equations, but you kind of may neglect the other terms or make some epsilon, and so right where these equations derive from that. In the whole industry writing these equations, I don't know if they have any uh, applications. Again, but this is a, again, mathematically, it would be pleasant to have a way described in words, in such a word, and then equation come without efforts at all. Like you say what to compute, and then you put into computer and compute and write formulas. But the formulas may be very messy, of course, yeah. But now, look at the next level, which is more, more closer to what we speak. And this is a physical chemistry of polymers and their folding, gelation, percolation, etc. And this is this will come, just say some words about per percolation, maybe. So it was the first paper on percolation, if I'm not mistaken, appeared. In, in, in something, I, I may be mistaken, I will say something, 1880, which I learned from a lecture by Stas Smirnov, and it was an American mathematical monthly, and there was some percolation model described, and said, well, done, but work, you have to um, do something better, and then, of course, it was kind of forgotten, I don't uh, And so, so, by the way, in any case, I recommend very much, if you want to learn about percolation, listen to a lecture by Smirnov. I found it by far more informative than everything else. It's more kind of, uh, kind of uh, congenial to mathematics, we, we know and we, we use, then more traditionally the by Keston or Grimmith were more probabilistic uh, oriented. And then it was kind of it never existed. And then in 1941, it was by Flory. It's Flory and Stockmeyer, who was done it somewhat independently and later, but Flory, and he was this great chemist. But they speak about gelation, and their model is like that. So I have this molecule floating with some active ends, and then they may interact. And then either interaction, they may stick together, may become stronger with certain probability, or concentration becomes bigger. And at some moment, there is a, the thing becomes rigid, relatively become a jelly, right? And this is a critical, what's, and this is, of course, the same as percolation. And in percolation, the typical situation we have so let me formulate percolation in simple terms. Just if you try it in the kind of simplest terms, you can say. And uh, which is, of course, the first model to look at, and that's not at all which mathematicians much concerned with. You have a 
we have minimum inf information, the simplest meaning also the most general. You have a space X, metric space, Euclidean, for example, or I prefer maybe compact and Riemannian manifold, but which, yeah, and which is uh, kind of in involved. And you take on random the n point, say it's g dimensional space. And there I would say number of points will be n to the power d. I think it's convenient, right? And then you take epsilon uh, or, or constant times constant times reached by n, and take and around each pole you take a you take a ball of this size. Okay. So you take these points. So they kind of they kind of uniformly cover the space. So a typical distance between the points will be one over n, and you take balls so they may overlap with some constancy. And so you have a set. And then you ask what is the geometry of the set, and and this point, which will be uh, essential for what I'm saying, is just geometry is in what the hell is geometry? There are so many invariants, you cannot speak about them. But once you have this parameter, C, radius, so you have not one set, family of sets. And then you look at the topology. Topology is a weak invariant. But when there is parameter, there are numeric invariants when things change, how topology changes, right? And so we will return to this picture, which I had of Morse function. You have this Morse function, and this big space and some function, maybe energy or just parameter of that, and we vary it, topology changes. And the moment it changes are numbers, and these numbers are invariant, numerical invariants, right? How we make invariants of spaces. This, and this is one from basic mechanism, which is parallel to what, how Boltzmann was, is described, physically described, described physical system, right? And to which we shall return later on. And, uh, and then, yes, you want, uh, want to understand it, and one of the phenomena is that we, we want to know what happens when n goes to infinity as function of c, so in the limit, and then this kind of with a phase transition, that something happens in particular discrete moments with, with respect to C. In, uh, this is more, more, more correspond to this picture of gelation but the same percolation. And then you make some specific metric spaces and what you mean by balls. Or it may be not balls, but some canonical subset there. Right? It may be, if you have, you, for example, you have you, 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 Euclidean plane, you have preferred lattice, and you subset, you change edges of the cubical lattice on something else. It, we have a lot of specificity which emphasize immediately the usual presentation percolation theory for reason I uh, hard to understand because uh, it, it, it would be completely unjustified except, which makes, in my view, is justified is only one thing, and this is theorem of Smirnov. So there is, a, there is a theorem there which is like a thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's quite kind of a, a, a remarkable thing, and just I want to explain what it is, which is not obvious, which is simple, and which is it says well, maybe it's not nonsense what the people are doing there, because for otherwise everything else look why the hell that? I mean, not this model, not this model, not that model. In some particular situation, some remarkable thing happens, which was predicted by first conjectured by length lens with quarters and percolation, and particular formula was right, written by somebody called Kra Cardi or Cardi, I forgot because it was not called Cardi, but said Cardi, yeah. huh? Cardi, da. And so what it is, yeah, let me remind you, if you don't know, something crazy. Yeah. So you have this random presentation, some say a ball in the space or something else, and then look at the, some, maybe I take a different picture, this maybe is too, too 
elegant. It must be a little more curved, yeah? So to make it a more clear. So look at this shape, and this shape may grow, 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 grow. Everything in the limit. So you can make scale, making this ball smaller, or you can, the main bigger, which is the same. And you see what is probability that there is a path going from here to here in your subset. So you make particular subset, you may consider if you take this ball very small, a probability very rare, they will be kind of distributed, there will be little islands spread everywhere, or there may be bigger things. And so what I'm interested in is in the probability of that. And below, uh, this grow, grow below some probability, below some density of some, some radius, whichever parameter. This will be zero. It cannot go from here to here. There will be no pass here. After some moment, the pass appears in this critical moment. So maybe before going to this minimum, let me give some kind of very kind of trivial stuff which is look completely trivial, but there are some technical points which, which needs, needs, needs proof yes, for, for, for proving it correctly. And, it's, and this is a subtle to understand what I'm saying is non-trivial. First you look at this, what the hell these people were doing, with smart people, like, but let me give an instance of, of, of that. So the, one of the common models like that, you have this lattice, and so what each, each edge you preserve, or eliminate with some probability p. Yeah. So this characteristic number, say so you preserve each edge probability p, or it disappears probability 1 over p. So, and so they have this graph depending on p. Now we have this huge rectangular, or square, and what you want to know, to which probability there is a path going from here to here with positive probability, or pass doesn't exist. This probability goes to zero. Again, we have infinitely large square. So there is a limit. And not surprisingly, answer is one half. And this is a theorem by Keston saying it could be critical probability one half. So it means if probability you check with one half, there is no pass. If more than one, there is a pass. And what happens at one half is subtle matter. It is finite probability, value of which is a very tricky number. I, I'm not certain it's computed for this square. Yeah, it may be computed, but in f it full understanding is conjectural. As they say, so what's conjectural about it? So, why is one half? And one half because Poincare duality. Because, and this is kind of exactly, it's not multiplication type mathematics. However simple, it says that if I have a set going from here to here, you cannot go here. That's clear. But this is necessary and sufficient. Right? If there is no pass from here in one set, then there is a pass. It may be extremely tricky. Yeah? If something doesn't exist, something else exists. And this is Poincare duality. And Poincare duality is quite remarkable and profound theorem. Yes, I just once, with my experience, I was writing something elementary introduction to topology, kind of in the spirit of Poincare. And you can do every, all homology theory, Tom isomorphism, novikov browder theorem, by just waving your hands. Except for two things you had to, without thinking really, just from general principle. Except, at some moment, you have to use the Serre theorem by the homotopy group of spheres and Poincare duality. Poincare duality is not kind of that easy. You have to do something kind of simple, but not, not canonical. And on Serre theorem, on the contrary, is something rather canonical, but on the algebraic level, beyond my geometric understanding. It's spectral sequences, how the hell they work, there's linear algebra, but you, it's not the kind of geometric picture, I could never make a geometric proof. But, and here it forms duality. And it works in all dimensions, and that's the proof, because this self dual lattice, you move it, it's dual to itself. In general, for any lattice, you take dual triangulation. And so this two percolation is self dual. And, but what's, what's the problem? Of course, it's obvious here, but then you say, aha, uh -huh, the point is that when one pass of, uh, this appearing of this pass has several different interpretations, this critical probability, and you have to say they're all equal. That on this level it's obvious, and it's 
generalizes to all dimensions. If you have n dimensional cube, and there is a paper, I, I refer to a recent paper by Carl Levy subquarters, and you have this, or, or have any product of manifolds, x cross y. And you have triangular product of triangulations, and you make the same kind of middle dimensional, say the x cross x probably would be better, so not to confuse x cross x, and you have triangulation here, here, and their product, and you throw away with prob probability middle dimensional faces, then appearance cycles, x cycles and y, in the y cycle will be one half. But the same reason, but then the whole theory becomes very, very, very subtle, and in general, it is high dimensional percolation, very. Uh, hmm? This high dimensional percolation is. Hello. Sorry? Something with sound? Uh -huh. This high dimensional percolation is not properly developed, and actually, thesis work on that. There are papers I, I refer to Freulich and others, and even understanding random surfaces becomes much more complicated. And it's kind of clear, I mean, it becomes complicated. On the other hand, just to, get, to, to, to have some some feeling before we come to this kind of really deep stuff, because it's just a many kind of obvious but difficult theorem, and they're difficult, well, it's kind of mathematics I not, don't understand, I cannot judge, it's just really kind of computational really things. And uh, so let me just explain one elementary stuff to have a feeling for percolation. So traditional searching for percolation And it was introduced by Hammersley and some, somebody else who's less known name for mathematician. It was in, in, in 1957. And unfortunately, I couldn't, couldn't find this paper because it's not in the open. It's some, uh, in, in, in England, some philosophical, Cambridge or whatever, philosophical society, it's not in the open dustbin. You cannot see, read it. But I found the next paper by, 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 by Hammersley, which was in, 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 so I don't know how, what, was, how, what they were saying in this first article. And I'm pretty certain they were not aware of Flory, who, who's done more or less the same before them 15 years ago. And uh, um, of course not the same, but infinitely more. Because, by the way, they also were concerned with some real problem about really percolation problem of, of ga ga gases through, through something, through a filter. So look, think about, say, trees. Yeah? Yes, I just want to say how much it depends on your point of view. Uh, say binary tree, and you throw away with some probability an edge, throw this, 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 with probability p. What is the critical probability that there will be still pass go with positive probability going to infinity? So if it's below this, it must, don't, it doesn't exist, after that it does. And then it is here, it's obvious, it's one half. And one half because binary tree. And how to think, if you think about the, this term, you throw it here and here and here, it's a little bit a mess, how you can see. Yeah? But now think in percolation terms, and then become obvious, or in genetic terms. So you just see what happens layer after layer. You go bigger and bigger, and, th and, and, and when you add new edges every time at a time. And then you see what you have is, is like a population growing. Either you divide or you die, or you have only one. And so if on the average your expectation of the number of your children is bigger than one, you, you, you grow exponentially. If less than one, you exponentially die. And because you have here binary tree, it's one half. If it were three, it will be one third. Right? So it's obvious. So, so this again, but again, you have to take percolation. What is interesting in all this computation probability, you have to write, organize it so there are independent variables so which you can make obvious, obvious computations. In percolation, also there are inequalities, and when you really come to interesting stuff, like in the case of, of Smirnov theorem, you have to use some combinatorics. You have to see some secret symmetry making things equal, and some probability equal, a big arrangement. And this part is tricky and certainly annoying. annoying. There might be something simpler than that, uh, up, to, up to a point. Now, if you apply this, say, percolation in the three space, on, on, in, the, in the plane, then you conclude, right, 
that if, if probability is big enough, you do go, you, 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 will, you will stop, right? Because here you don't realize all possibilities. We multiply, don't have multi exponential possibility, you only have growing, not growing, boundary doesn't grow exponentially, it grows only linearly. Therefore, we, so we, there is critical probability which may be very low, very high, and still you don't propagate. But why still there is probability you propagate? So why is big probability propagate? Because the previous argument doesn't work. The simplest argument, and the, uh, the non-computational one, use Poincaré duality. Because if there are few paths, then the also probability going around and having this will be also low. So imagine, no matter what you do, this long path don't appear. Then this thing will don't appear. Therefore, it can escape. Right. Right. So, so, and, but there is another, of course, more computational. You just pre pre repeat computation I make, but now you point on the line, and they when they only can multiply within this line if they come together. Well, it doesn't count. It's still one. They don't add up. But this, uh, but you make little computation, it still works. I haven't made this computation. I, I just don't know how. Comp they never say it. they write formulas. One way to make computation is you really look at the worst possible case when only this can do. But on the other hand, when you start dying and you went long enough, you have many holes and then there is an extra coefficient. And so I haven't seen, for example, what the critical rate of growth which this argument apply. Right? It has nothing to do with Poincaré duality, it's pure computation, it's trivial computation and must be somewhere done. But again, these people, they kind of don't ask for, from our point of view, obvious question and don't answer them. And certainly I, I, it's not for me to compute. So I don't know. But this, of course, works in, in all the, and this, of course, works in all. Once have propagation dimension two, you have in all dimensions. Similarly, you can do something for high dimen higher dimensional percolation, but then you get some little problems, of course. It's not so obvious what it is. Yeah. Okay, but now comes this conformal invariance. And all this is just, you know, it's some of them Poincaré duality, it's non-trivial stuff, but kind of we know that, and there are computational stuff, which I don't know, so uh, the, 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 the degree of, 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 of sophistication there, which I never studied, but here there is combinatorics, and this is really beautiful thing, and so what is, so con conjecture, sort of for example, if you have domain like that, Whatever kind of percolation is believed, this being conformally invariant. For the critical probability, when the first pass appears, this actual probability is a number, it's invariant of the domain, it's conformal invariant. And since conformal invariant, you can bring it to a particular shape, and the shape convenient, where the theory was proven by, by Smirnov, is tri a regular triangle, and you look at this pass, yeah? you know, any think with four points can, can be brought to this picture, right? Right, right, four point. And this probability, if it's triangle with unit sizes, the if it's a critical probability, this number will be the length of this triangle. If it was triangular lattice, lattice built out of triangles. And this is the theorem. It's very simple, very beautiful theorem, and the proof is so he, he, just, he explained this, he said, okay, they, they, f they found that new proof in the lecture is very kind of beautiful combinatorial proofs, which I feel, there's a feeling there must be much more general structure behind it, right? It's kind of elementary, just elementary combinatorics, you know, plus with this general principle of probability theory, which I didn't explain. And so let me f f indicate what is the, one of the technical problems in there, again, which I learned from this lecture. We'll see that good thing about this lecture, he explained what the problems are, not just showing what's already proven, which is certainly not instructive if you're not inside. So, so you, 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 you look at the following thing. Uh, you, you have this parameter P, right? So you t take or some eliminates or, or preserves some edge in some, say, lattice with probability p. And then what is the probability that you have infinite paths going from infinity? Of course, if, if, if you kill already positive percentage 
positive percentage of edges, with positive probability you'll be stuck. Yeah? Always there will be circle, right? Very small, exponentially decaying, but exists, yeah. But what's re remarkable is that if uh, as, I, as I explained, but if it is if it is close to zero, then you will, you will be stuck. So the probability of going to infinity looks like that. It goes here and then goes to infinity like that. So we know up to some point it will be zero, up to some point it will be an increasing function. But what's non-trivial is continuous. But this is the theorem of these guys, and this apparently are known in dimension three. But this function is continuous. And the key point is Poincare duality here. Right, we can make it continuous. And this is, what, as Smirnov says, this is a difficult point probability. Indeed, this is not obvious from kind of hand waving. And this is, and this is kind of hard, because when you think about that, you assume it's completely continuous. Yeah? And you don't think about that. And then kind of, he explains this why it's, the theory is non-trivial. This is non-trivial point, and it's unknown in dimension three. What, according to his lecture about, I think two years ago, maybe now it's known. But this is about percolation. Now, what percolation has to do with protein folding? What a problem there, and uh, and, and with, uh, with self-avoiding random walk. So another kind of. Um, I think I discovered by Flory, and is, uh, is more pronounced, and for which he actually received Nobel Prize, yeah, for 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 understanding the role of self-avoiding in the behavior of molecules. He really kind of explain and predict quite a few phenomena. Is the following: so self-avoiding walk. So again, you look at square lattice, or whichever, and you look at the path going on random, but just self-avoiding, it wasn't mean on random. Or, and, of course, it's much more natural looking in the liquid. You can see the chains of points where these distances must be one. Look at all this configuration, take measure on there, and you want to understand uh, how a typical sequence will look like if it's self-avoiding, meaning that this distance is one, all other distance is bigger than one. So it's some domain, and if you, all distance are one, it's some high dimensional manifold, and then it's some domain in this manifold, and this is how it looks like. It's a tremendous mess. So the point is, the space, so this is blue, is where it is diagonal, where it stick together, and white is uh, remaining space. And the, you know, if you want to understand, you take random point there, this random point gives you a path, how it looks like. First, it's unknown the question has any answer. It may not look in any particular case. Maybe half of them look this way, another half this way. No, uh, physics, physics, physics is very, very uncommon. And you always believe, believe this concentration of statistics, average and, and, and typical coincide. However, you know, it is not true in biology, right? Winner takes all, opposite principle, right? If you have a lottery, average lottery and the expected gain, kind of opposite. Expected gain for every individual, zero. Expected gain on the average is total sum, right? <laughs> completely, completely opposite picture, right? And this, by the way, is a source of mistakes when physicists speak about evolution and speak about randomness. And this is exactly the point. When you speak about randomness applied, you, you always make assumptions according to your background. And there is a kind of this remarkable story about Fred Hoyle, who was spending some time arguing against traditional version of evolution. And Fred Hoyle is a, kind of a, um, made one of the greatest discoveries, in, most ingenious discoveries in physics, I think, in the 20th century. And so, and uh, he was, was uh, uh, there was kind of, kind of interesting story, and he never received Nobel Prize, and Nobel Prize received his student, and the reason for, for Hoyle was he was overqualified. And there were some people acci acci by, by accident received this who were overqualified, I believe, Einstein and Girac, I believe, and Hoyle. I think three people were overqualified. There were far more fantastic discoveries than anybody else. And so what, what was the point of Hoyle? You know that. 
you, you don't know. So he made the following conclusion, the following what he was logic. The fact life exists on Earth. Fact. Conclusion. There exists isotope, some particular isotope of, of nitrogen, I forgot, which exists one trillionth of a second, which was unknown. So he made this prediction on the basis of existence of life, right? and and I say what was his logic, and people were laughing at him, of course, but some people at, at Fermi lab, I believe, believed him and made experiment and found this isotope. And this, I think, was really kind of fantastic. To <laughs> so, how did it work? Right? What is the relation? So, what is what may, what, what isotope of nitrogen or anything else has to do with life on Earth, which exists one trillionth of a second anyway? Yeah, <laughs> you never see it. I think this is fantastic stuff. I, I just cannot resist kind of telling this, because whole understood where all heavy elements came from to, to on Earth, where, where they came from. Because if you look at the, the process in the star, in the, in the sun, it burns uh, hydrogen, then there is helium, helium, and sometimes helium goes a little bit to lithium, and that's it. And what about carbon? The key, of course, is carbon, yeah? Because life is based on carbon life. Of course, maybe some other life, but the only life we, can, we know, we can imagine, is carbon-based life because uh, no other element has enough, enough flexibility to make co complicated compounds. And he, re he, he make a conjecture or prediction that this comes under the explosion of supernova, on, on, on supernova, see super, su su uh, how the super, super supernova, supernova, yeah. Because at this moment, temperature goes to, to, to billions of centigrade and various nuclear reactions take place and then and they explode and go around the universe, and sometimes they come to the planets. So we are kind of a stardust in a very precise, precise sense. A remnants of the burning stars. But in order to have to go to, to carbon from hydrogen, this process, there are certain rules of nuclear chemistry, you need, this doesn't work. You make this computation, it doesn't work. And then he realized you need intermediate. And this intermediate was some particular isotope of, of, of nitrogen. And he just made the discovery. And this, I think, and, um, he was very, very good. But he actually, though, though I'm joking, he was not quali because not, he was quali overqualified because he was a very nasty person. He was all fighting with everybody. People didn't like him. And so he just gave this to the student. The student was completely devastated, yeah, because he was just, he was just, uh, 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 I wrote some paper afterwards. And anyway, the student was really most unha unhappy, unhappy Nobel laureate, yeah, because he was really ashamed, yeah. And he was a good scientist, of course, but he, he, he didn't invent the theory. He just made some imp more precise computations. But, but what Hoyle was doing, he was looking at some particular proteins, and there are pro proteins which, uh, histones, proteins which make your, uh, uh, shape your DNA, and the rate of their mutation is known, is just almost the same for all organisms. And you take little mutation and you're dead, right? It's not fully understood why, but this is the most conserved protein. And he said it's impossible to have evolution with this. They couldn't come by, by chance. The probability is not enough. And, uh, and, and then the, the, and, and he was fighting, and, and he was the idea, of course, that there are more. He was not kind of believing in the God, but saying there might be something else in the universe and from where this, this chemical c came on Earth and couldn't be formed. But the point is that him, like most physicists, when we make computation, they make some assumptions. And one of the assumptions, but if you don't see any correlation, there is no correlation, things are independent. And using that, you can make a reasonable prediction of the rate of mutation of proteins, and some of them in experiments. And there are experiments when they have artificial mutation, and uh, you go from protein A to protein A prime, which changes function in, in certain direction by artificial selection. And so it, you modify it many times, many times, and select which are most close to what you want. And you can evaluate, we know how the rate of this changes, and where you have to go, and say how many cycles you have to make. And, and there is particular experiment, 
somebody explained to me who was performing that, and, and there is a computation with fees and say, well, it takes about, say, 1,000 cycles, which is, will take you months and months to do. And then you may experiment, you do it in five. And nobody understood why. It's some mathematics of this, because probability is not, uh, things are not independent, yeah. There are co correlations which are not uh, physical, whatever, the, they in the matter of things. And this is extremely well seen or, or unseen in protein folding. This is the perfect problem is showing that there are some very basic mathematics we don't understand, absolutely not, how proteins fold. Or, and, 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 and as a model question, much easier but very well shaped, is question of a self-avoiding random walk. And the self-avoiding random walk, by the way, the way I described it, it's a very interesting question. Why I say this measure? Why I take all paths must have equal measure? Why not to say, make, add one molecule at a time? So it makes one stop at a time. But then, of course, any elementary exercise, every random walk become blocked. On the planes, about 70 steps, it will be blocked. Of course, always you arrive in a region and you cannot, cannot go out in any dimension. Now, and I think this random box, self avoiding random box, protein folding are closely related, and you have to understand this picture. So, at one point, of course, the space of embedded curves, say, it's well understood for closed curves, topology is extremely complicated. If this pass, all this complication appear, appear geometrically. Again, if you introduce certain parameters and create this topology in more artificially. So it's a very complicated topology of not theory implicitly in there in dimension three. In dimension two, it's another story, and it's, it may be eventually solved. But what, the, what is the problem, elementary problem? And it seems extremely difficult. So just on the plane, say, usual random walk goes, if you make n step, the distance will be square root of n. The question is, what happens to the self-avoiding walk? Will it more than square root of n or less than square root of n? And Flory in dimension three predicted some number will be more, it goes further. And he made very good prediction using this idea that just part of the walk excludes some volume. And so it takes change probability space, volume changes. And he made prediction which very well correspond to experiment, but they're approximate. Uh, and the answer, of course, is more, but nobody can prove it, neither in the plane nor in the, in, in the, in the three space, that you go further than the square root, right? All you can do, roughly, that you cannot be, become concentrated, uh, just go uh, 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 moving nowhere, right? This is just what you can say. You just cannot fill the space completely, which is, this you can show. This is extremely kind of trivial, non -trivial, trivial result and very kind of no, 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 not uh, exciting. So what the difficulty here? So this is a very, and it's kind of, if probability at all can work here, if it's meaningful to, to ask this question, yeah? If you look at the, what happens to a proton, how they move, it's another story. Of course, then you have different world and you have different questions, and it's not that setting. You have moving molecules there and the water, water interact with them, and there are very many things happening. And the most remarkable thing, of course, with protein, the default. That's so a protein is such a molecule, and some of this, it's a chain, usually not very long, about, say, 200 amino acids. And it's, when it falls, it always takes a very fast, very particular form. And if, again, you get rough com computation, you see it would never happen at the time it happened. It happens on the level of milliseconds or seconds, otherwise you would die. And this is the reason, if the, if the, and the a rough computation you make, it, it, it goes into days or years. It's a long process, and you don't know its mechanism. There are kind of physical models now, more or less, uh, with reasonable, very rough, with reasonable prediction, but there is no mathematical theory. There are computer programs which kind of can guess what will be the shape of the, of, of the fold, and it's important for understanding the function of protein. It's not the last word. And, uh, and this has something to do also with percolation. And, and also exactly with dimension three, I guess. If it were dimension two or dimension four, it would be very di difficult, very different, and much easier problem, and the folding would be impossible. So apparently what happens, 
this kind of you can fantasize. And this happens in cell indifferent. When you have this thing and it moves around, sometimes it tends to cross itself. And the moment it touches itself, a certain, a certain bases start interacting. And it may happen that there are arrangements, because they're not random sequences, they're rather special, but still not terribly special. They hit with reasonably, uh, 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 reasonable probability in the, the place when they're not only stick, but also oriented. And then next movement, you don't go away, but you slide along, for example. And this is a typical thing which happens in cell, right? When you have a cell, and you have this DNA, and, and it is some protein which find the place where to, to do it. And if you do by diffusion everywhere, it's very unlikely, but what it does, it goes somewhere, becomes sticking a little bit, and then go along. And then it becomes much faster. And this was a very interesting kind of theory of random walks, when there are really very, very medium has different dimensions. So some random walk become in dimension three, and some one-dimensional random walk. But of course, if it's certainly does, if it's stick, it certainly jump back and forth. It certainly kind of computation become messy. But mathematical description of this very simple, just general principle, like uh, very simple implementation of this, like uh, like uh, uh, equation of motion. They're very simple. It's Hamiltonian. You follow Hamiltonian. That's it. But then you there are different Hamiltonians, and here, here is the same. You can describe it in a similar universal language. But specific, but specific kind of specified parameters become computationally maybe difficult. But mathematically, transparent, quant transparent thing. So, and so there may be, if you start thinking those terms, you may can get some in, in, in intuition about what that. But that's one of the unsolved problem, and unclear what it is. And again, there is one amusing uh, uh, result also of hexagonal lattice of Smirnov with Huga, who's here not in this audience, I guess, but in this initiative, that it, it doesn't tell anything about the diameter of that. It's beyond what we can do, but it tells you what percentage of, what percentage of pass will be self-avoiding. And this number is square root of 2 plus, yeah, there is some number in, is involved in that. P properly understood percentage is like that. You see, so you, you count how many different random paths are there, you take log and divide by n, and go to the limit, the limit obviously exists, it's sub, it's sub additive, sub multiplicative function, and this is a number. And so it's kind of said, huh, it's not complete nonsense. Right, again, you can say it's all the theory, it's just so natural. You see, just I remember I was speaking many times ago about this kind of things with Jean Bourguin, and I'm saying, see, with probability, there's so many interesting problems. You just take this geometric problem, say random, and then you have, and then he says, well, I mean, it's trivial, trivial questions. And either they're obvious, all this percolation, he said, for him it was all obvious before, before Smirnov, or it's a completely uh, unreachable, non mathematical like self avoiding, it's just, you can do nothing. So it's just not good. However, now there is progress, and certainly it's not, not nonsense. And, uh, and it is this one of what you call thing. Yeah, it's not just idea, it's real stuff happening there, and we have to look from outside and understand what it is. Okay, my time is over, and I certainly not through what I wanted to say today. Let me see, maybe I say a couple of words what I wanted to say today. Yeah, this is what you're saying. Yeah, this is voice uh, equation. Oh, maybe I said everything. Ah, right. Yeah, I wanted to say something about languages. Maybe do it. Do, will you allow me for now ten minutes? Yeah. Uh, just so so far it was about probability theory, and saying where it goes and where it doesn't go, and certainly. They're saying it needs some uh, much thinking. And another instance of that, of completely different kind of problems, are in natural languages, which is similar to what happens to evolution in biology. I mentioned this confusion with, with Hoyle. And even more, this happens to natural languages. And so I want to make some, uh, some people who understand languages 
unlike myself. Ah, also I didn't say about von Neumann and, and, and about entropy. Well, probably I will not have time to say it. But now I want to, to make some quotation, discuss some, so this is some, I make some, we can find here some references. This, this is not a, if you have a copy of that, it's not final version. I will certainly rewrite it in some moment in a more systematic way, but yeah, here is some reference to something I mentioned. But now I want to say something else about uh, probability in linguistics, which is similar to probability in evolution biology. So the point is that the way the way you use probability, effective use of probability in physics, in my view, is due basically to symmetry. You can make assumption of something independent, something is equal, because things are highly symmetric, like particles moving, moving in, 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 this, in space. And there's huge symmetry there, which I, uh, my next lecture, I explain how you can exploit it from a different angle. But it's not so in the language. And so, what is probable, what is improbable in language? And so, there is some quotation by of Chomsky. Uh, but where, where is Chomsky? Then I explain some particular instance of this, how, you, how probability comes. Yeah, here is what, so, so before that I was quotation, I'm taking this is just copies from some articles which I'm in the process of writing on languages, so t <laughs> that you can, do you, can you use probability in languages? And what Chomsky says, no, because every sentence, almost every sentence in, in life which comes is said for the first time and will never be repeated, which is not quite true, yeah. Much things I defeated, but if it's long enough, of course not. And so you can ascribe probability to it. And so it's complete nonsense. However, especially in the modern techniques of uh, language, artificial language processing, you use prob probabilistic models, and they work pretty well. And, uh, and then objection to Chomsky is as, as follows, two, twofold. First, in, in physics also, you, you assign probability to a particular position of atoms, or many atoms involved, and this is an infinitesimal number. They never enter this number. And they, 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 they never enter any particular position. If you have billions of article, particles, and they, well, this here or there, of course, is exponentially small number, right? It is something like 2 to the 10 to the minus 10 to the 25 or something. Probability of any state. The probability that if you divide it in two halves, and each particular particle will be either here or there, it will be 2 to the power of this Avogadro number. It's absurd. Probability makes no sense. But what does make sense, the two probabilities are equal. Even they, it makes no sense. And this was one of the reasons, by the way, why some people were skeptical about the uh, atomic theory. But in languages, it's, it's different, yeah, because you don't know how to equate them and how to, uh, how to count them. And so, so I want to, what I want to say that probability, in fact, in languages is not a number, but something else. And it's some, uh, so you have to think as, as a probability theory for language as a functor from the category, whatever it is, of languages to the category of some objects which represent probability. <coughs> and one of them is a tree-like picture. Yes, if, if, let me see if I have this picture here of some tree. Why does move? Ah, yeah, yeah. ah I, might, I think I forgot to make this tree. Why? Wait one second. Ah, okay, I make a picture there. So, if you look, what is the frequency of a word? And what is the frequency of a sentence? <coughs> if you look at the some string, short string of symbols, 
some murder sentence, and what's produced, you see how often being appears. But when it appears, it doesn't appear just where, appear in what. You just look at the longer strings. So it may happen like that. You may be word, and then it may be like that. For example, if you take strings, pigs fly, and then it looks like that. Yeah, it always appears in the same sentence. You, 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 you see that when pigs fly. And there will be some very few sentences just it, uh, which, which uh, no, I'm sorry, it's a wrong picture on the contrary. It's like that, and then to be like that. It will be few, but very long, and then they don't branch. But if you have simple words, very usable words, it branches immediately and look more like that. Therefore, combinatorics of this tree is more essential than the particular numbers of probabilities attached. Right? And so, and, 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 and by the way, trees, especially with weight attached to them, makes a category very similar to category of numbers. You can compose trees, you can add trees, they kind of make kind of a, almost like algebra, right? I, I, I don't have the time to explain that. And this may be, however, it's not three, they're more complicated graphs. And that's quite interesting phenomenon in, in languages, and f formalizing it's not obvious. And this is what I, this is called, this is a Vinograd schema change. Yeah. So, The package doesn't fit into my in my bag because it's too large and because it's too small. And you have to figure out what is true on the base of statistics. And you see, it's just agrees. You look at the Google. However, if you replace doesn't fit by fit and explain this, oh, it will be it will be it will be the same pictures. It will tell you nothing, because it, 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 this example, it, 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 I took it because exactly just it's classical example in, 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 in study of the uh, automatic analysis of languages. But if you look at something much more, much more elementary, if you look what cat eats, what, the more, what was more typical, cat eat mice or cat eat grass. And you look at the Google, and you then you learn that cat eat grass, but not mice. You, I, I made this experiment some, some while ago, but, no, but almost no cat ever eat, eat grass. Or if kid eat chocolate, and then you find out that my kid, my cat never eat chocolate, but your kid very often eat chocolate, right? And there is a good reason for that, yeah? So, so there are combinatorial arrangements of, of words, they are still combinatorial, and so probability is there, but that's another kind of problem how to find the right setting for that. And of course in machine learning, it's, this subtle thing is ignored, there is a machinery of the neural networks which works so remarkably well. But, I mean, but again, it works, is the opinion, this is such a, that it's like, like, like democracy, it works, it's the worst possible system, but we don't have another one. They, they're not really something especially good about that. It just was developed. And there may be much better system. So our brain is work slightly better. Uh, that because the number of computations make much less achieve comparable results. Right. So for example, this machine which play chess, they definitely made more computation than the human brain done. And, and they, they play still comparably to human, slightly better, but comparably to the, the best chess players. And the mystery how these pe people work, how people can play chess, is much more mysterious. With such a primitive brain, yeah, computer, very slow. It's a billion times slower. So, this is a, it, uh, the last point we had, I wanted to make, where, which is a source of ideas on probability theory coming from languages. And so, rephrasing, rephrasing Chomsky, it's not he says that you can't apply a probability, but you, ha but you have to say you have to modify a probability in order to apply it 
and and make sense of 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 languages. And this is of course we will be different probability. And then in the my my following lectures, I will explain where you can go from there. So we look at this and now kind of the same pictures we had, but look from a different kind of perspective. What probability will be and from more, more topological and geometric, and we'll have no application to real world, but mathematically quite amusing and based again on some mathematical facts, which is which is no. Okay. For today it is all. Thank you. Feel free to ask questions now. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so this uh, uh, Schmirnov's theorem that you said, it's for the triangular lattice, right? Yes. Whereas the Poincaré duality that you mentioned was for the well, square, square lattice. lattice. Yeah. So right. why is why doesn't this method for the triangular lattice go through to prove? No, because you see, just yes, his uh, eventually they use a simple form formula. This interpretation of the Cardi formula, which is for triangles, for regular triangles. This is kind of a technical level. This makes a simple form. This probability is exactly the length of this edge. And but my my interpretation would be the following: that the symmetry group of triangular lattices rotating around, but irreducible, but square is reducible. So it's more symmetry there. And therefore, it's, it was most apparent in the original proof by, by Smirnov, which is uh, now they have simply a proof. He, he developed a calculus, on, on kind of Kashiriman kind of calculus on this latches. And because it has more symmetry, it's closer to usual Kashiriman. And when it's split, uh, like the square, it's probably not so. This possibly explanation. Uh, but uh, they, they play some game with hexagon. Of course, there is duality. There is duality between Poincare duality still applies, but we, we go from triangular lattice to hexagonal lattice. And this game is played in this proof, yeah. They, and they prove not duality, but some kind of truality. They have three thick quantities which are related by some analytic relation, and from there it comes, based on some combinatorics. Well, I just, you have to. Yes, look at this paper or listen to him. I just, I don't know the details, I just only know it superficially. It's a rather a non-trivial argument, yeah, it's not something simple. And there is no, no, and, but, and, but for all we, but it's quite, but if you start thinking about that, you see that in all dimensions there must be something like that. That this, there must be universality, there must be simple principle, you expect them to be true, and then they somehow, somehow not obvious how to prove them, how shape, how it depends on the shape, some continuity, some symmetry, uh, how it's involved. Uh, there is, this is one of the kind of most amazing result in the theory. So you, you, there is no simple explanation for that. It was a big problem, and it was one of the really most spectacular results in mathematics. It's just really not something you can say easily. I don't understand it. Yeah, I don't want to say what I don't understand. But actually everything I was saying I don't understand. But exactly my point was to convince you that you also don't understand, so you may start thinking, yeah. That's my, my justification of my non-understanding. Huh? Something you you're supposed to not understand and ask me, yeah? <laughs> what else you don't <laughs> understand? I think we don't understand what probability is. I mean, yes. in people, yes, you develop some branches, but of the whole picture, what it is, what it is, we don't know. We, maybe we are the, and uh, where it, how it should go, it's impossible. Again, referring to Poincaré, I want to say, you can play with names, or you can, but you never go to the, to the bottom of things unless you know where the things are. You have to know where the things are and play with these things, and then you come back to, to your names. And probability, much of that was playing with the names, sometimes very successfully, like in these examples, but also with completely abysmal failure, like this self-avoiding random walk, or this three-dimensional percolation, or many other, this kind of problems. And another example I want to question, I can bring forth, that there is a percolation of discrete kind of quantities, 
there is one dimensional thing, and even when they close up, closed up, and there is this various measure in the space of closed curves. With some effort, there is a theory of random surfaces or, or maps from surfaces somewhere using conformal parameterization, and then you stop in dimension three. And so conjecture would be there is no probability theory for higher dimensional, say, manifolds or cycles or whatever. That may be a very special thing, but not generally impossible because when you start closing it, you so much break in dependence that you cannot do anything. Thing becomes absolutely chaotic and uncontrollable. The question is how to formulate precisely before trying to prove it. Right? So there are limits where probability theory works. You understand what these limits are. Right? It's not everything, not everything you can formulate you can do. At some moment you run into in principle in some way unsolvable problems. Or not solvable in the language or in the style we accept, uh, but we, 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 we know. So, and this is, I think, is, is the point. But this is a kind of rather traditional probability. And another aspect that there are many alternative probabilities. I, 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 here I cite, I was giving lectures, what are the alternative probabilities exist. Uh, the Romanian, by now, the, nowadays, there are several alternative theories, and some will develop, and some in the course of development. And Probability is very peculiar part of mathematics. Yeah, it's not truly, it only has one leg in mathematics and one outside. And we don't know where the thought is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Why did you say that um, Grothendieck was one of the best at naming things? Well, because uh, this is a parallel you can bring between probability theory and algebraic geometry. That Grothendieck developed this definition of scheme, and then he had this definition of like topo or the other. And this definition of scheme came a few years after the appearance of the book by Andre Wey and Algebra Foundation of Algebraic Geometry when the way you define algebraic variety is a set of points of some universal field. And it's exactly parallel to how growth and uh, how Kolmogorov defined probability. This universal probability space, ta ta ta, all that. And growth and dig, uh, shown, it's not right definition. It's not a set, right? It's kind of a scheme, it's kind of a function uh, uh, in, uh, from category of, category of uh, algebras to, to category of sets or something like that. It's not a set at all. And he, he gave the right concept, definition, name for, for algebraic variety. And this is not done for probability theory, because probably there are several probability theories that are different. Of course, Grothendieck is not the last word. It's time to revise it. Every such concept must be revised every 50, 70 years. If you use the same definition, fundamental logic, 50, 70 years and don't change it, something is wrong. It's time you have to, be, and now there are, of course, accumulated evidence, things and like what coming from from like from mirror symmetry, that there is something else in algebraic geometry is not really properly grasped by the concept of if, uh, words given, names given to it to Grothendieck, yeah? And he introduced many other names in algebraic geometry. And he a fantastic way of giving correct definitions. And sometimes you, which is not taken by other domain mathematics, there are lots of stupid definitions. And really definition making kind of themselves kind of unity, well organized, and algebraic geometry. And it has tremendously positive impact while algebraic geometry was developing so fantastically well. Right? And this is the same if you do it in another domain. It's certainly maybe not possible. It's, it's desirable, maybe not possible. Yeah? But it, it definitely was not, this was not happening. It has not been happening here. Yeah. So, but Grothendieck was a master of giving right name. Yeah? You know, in, in, in algebraic geometry, you have these words and they stick and they're so really, so kind of you know, guiding you very well. But, and of course, in, in, in probability, in, in mathematics, there are other examples of that, but the, in the recent time, Grothendieck's name come, comes to, the, to my mind first. Yeah. Maybe the other, I don't know if there are similar points. You know, so, so simple to see, what is algebraic curve? And it was, before Grothendieck was not the way to say it properly, right? There was no context. You see, you cannot define objects just out of context. You have to create this context. And he understood the right context to define algebraic curve. And with probability, for me, uh, 
We don't know what is a context or several of them where it should be defined. And Kolmogorov, in my uh, the way I see it, is just uh, out of date. Of course, the technical formalism, everything remains, right? But the question, if you want to go next step, you have to ch change, change f f f foundations. So, so. Thank you. okay, thank you. <laughs>